Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I, I'm Owen Lewis, I'm chair of the IIEA Climate Working Group, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this webinar, which is co-organized with the Environmental Protection Agency. The event is part of the Environmental Resilience Lecture Series, which explores topics such as the circular economy, air quality, environmental governance, the bio economy, sustainable waste management, water quality, and today, climate finance. I would like to thank the EPA for their generous sponsorship of this series. To achieve Europe's climate goals, every company, every financial firm, every bank, insurer, and investor will need to change. Countries need to manage the increasing impacts of climate change on their citizens' lives, and they need the funding to do it. The scale and speed of the changes necessary to move towards climate resilience will require public and private finance. We are delighted to have the opportunity today to hear the insights of a renowned expert in the important field of sustainable finance. It is a real pleasure to welcome Josh Delbecke to the IIEA, and I would like to thank him for sparing the time today. Uh, Joss is a professor at the European University Institute's School of Transnation, Transnational Governance, uh, where he serves as the university's European Investment Bank Chair on Climate Change Policy and International Carbon Markets. He is also professor at the Catholic University in Leuven in Belgium. From 2010 to 2018, Professor Delbecke was Director General of the Commission's DG Climate Action. In this role, he was centrally involved in setting the EU's climate and energy targets for 2020 and 2030, and was a key player in developing EU legislation on the emissions trading system. Professor Delbecke was previously the Commission's Chief Negotiator at the UNFCCC Conference of the Parties, where he was responsible for the EU's implementation of the Kyoto Protocol and pivotal in the negotiation of the Paris Agreement. As an economist, he underlined the role of market-based instruments and of cost-benefit analysis in the field of the environment. The title of today's address is The European Green Deal and Sustainable Finance. Professor Dubaika would speak to us for about 20 minutes or so, and after his presentation, we will go to the Q&A session. You can join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see on your screen. Uh, feel free to send your questions in throughout the, uh, the session. You don't need to work, uh, wait until the end. Um, and a reminder that today's uh, presentation and also the Q&A session are on the record. Uh, you should also feel free to, to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle uh, EPA underscore IIEA. First, now, let me hand over to Laura Burke, Director General of the Environmental Protection Agency, to make some opening remarks. Uh, Laura. Thank you very much, Owen. And we in the Environmental Protection Agency are really delighted to be supporting this lecture series and also delighted that Yas has kindly agreed to uh, talk to us this morning. Uh, really, really interesting and really topical, uh, particularly as in Ireland, this is Climate Finance Week, so the timing couldn't be better. And of course, as Owen said, public and private finance are both necessary for climate action here in Ireland, uh, as well, of course, as, as around Europe and globally. And we need creative solutions to ensure that public finance catalyzes private action. Climate action can also serve as a lever to, to attract more international finance flows into Ireland. The European Investment Bank has a mandate to increase the share of its finance, uh, financing represent, uh, with regard to both climate and sustainability up to 50% by 2025. And this represents a significant increase. And again, of course, a key opportunity for Ireland. In addition, Irish sovereign bonds are also an instrument that can successfully leverage private finance for public investment. These and other measures like green budgeting are, welcoming, are welcome, however more is needed, 
Uh, and we must phase out supports that are inconsistent with climate neutrality. So we need to do the good things and also phase out where we're supporting inconsistent uh, actions with our climate ambitions. With regard to the emissions trading scheme, and I wanted just to mention this because I know this is something that YAS was so heavily involved in, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency is the competent authority in Ireland for the emissions trading scheme. There are over 100 installations in Ireland covered by the scheme, everything from power generation, cement, large dairy plants, semiconductors and pharmaceutical plants. And in Ireland, there have been decreases from ETS emissions um, over the last number of years. This has been strongest in the power generation sector, uh, mainly because of increased uh, availability of renewables and the phasing out of coal and peat. And in fact, that's what makes it so concerning with the discussions we've been having over the last number of weeks around security of supply and potentially bringing coal back into the equation in Ireland which would have significant impact or potentially significant impact for greenhouse gas emissions. In addition, with regard to the emissions trading scheme, the cement industry have decreased emissions year on year, just under 6% in 2020 and 2% in 2019. And while these decreases are modest, we would hope that rising price of carbon will incentivize further investment in low carbon technologies. And the area will grow um, for Ireland, for the EPA and for the EU. And really interesting, the current proposals from the EU Commission to widen the scope of the EU ETS to include maritime buildings and transport. And of course, this may bring new opportunities as well as challenges, uh, both nationally and also at a European level. So that's really all I was going to say. So really looking forward to, to Yasa's presentation and I'm going to hand over uh, to him now. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Laura and Owen for uh, the uh, very kind introduction. And indeed, I'm going to speak also a little bit about uh, Europe's uh, ETS carbon market uh, in my introduction. Uh, but I have prepared a few slides, and uh, while we are waiting for them, uh, let me underline how pleased I am to be with the IIEA um, and uh, to, uh, to have this uh, discussion um, with all of you and eager to go into the questions. Now, on the next slide, what I would like to do uh, this morning uh, with you, next slide please, is to go, of course, a little bit in, you know, climate change, the IPCC report, but I'm going to pass over fairly quickly and to move to the Green Deal and the sustainable finance, or at least a, a few elements of sustainable finance that I would like to highlight. Now to start on the next slide, um, you know, we all know that climate change is a manifestation that we are experiencing over not only decades and centuries, but millennia, because we talk about the uh, fundamental cycle of things on which we are today, it is in the Holocene, and if we only look uh, and put ourselves on the scale of 20, 25,000 years ago, with a mark zero is the Roman times, you see how much the red line brings us out of range of what is normally happening in the climate system. So that's why people are talking about the Anthropocene instead of, uh, and, 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 and say that we may be moving out of the Holocene, which is newly uncovered territory. So the IPCC has been doing great work on that. We have been seeing it over the summer, the forest fires, the flooding, not only in Europe, uh, quite heavily, and quite, uh, you know, Europe was quite uh, openly uh, and clearly hit, but also throughout the world. And one region um, that is bothering me a lot is the Arctic, because their climate change is twice as fast as what we experience in our zones. And we see there a lot happening uh, in terms of permafrost and methane emissions, in terms of new navigation routes, and in, you know, also in terms of the new military presence, because that zone becomes uh, very important. But moving on to the next slide, where are these emissions coming from? Well, um, it is very surprising, actually, uh, and it was not as clearly foreseen that as of the 1990s, with the industrialization of what we are calling 
the emerging economies we are have been entering into a new phase and a new phase that brings us up to a level where we have not yet peaked the global emissions. We would have hoped that Corona, the Corona pandemic would help us in peaking those emissions, but uh, you know, it doesn't look like we are going to have seen already a major um, peaking of those emissions. And it is since the 1990s where the new part of the world is rapidly industrializing. So that's why when we look on the next slides for COP26, that the Paris Agreement commitments are not good enough. And we have to take a next step. And the, I think the EU was right in 2019 to make the first step towards climate neutrality by 2050 and a 55 reduction at least by 2030, which was followed by major important players in the world, not least China. It is uh, President Xi Jinping at the, at the uh, <coughs> United Nations gathering who declared himself <clears throat> and China to be ready for carbon neutrality by 2060. And of course, you know, the United States uh, followed as well with the election of President Biden, which brings us that the three big players on carbon and climate policy in the world have made strong commitments now followed by more than 60 countries covering more than half of the uh, global emissions. So COP26, as from that perspective, doesn't look uh, too bad. Now on the next slide, you know, what is then Europe's climate vision on all this? Well, it's clear that uh, today's climate change is caused by the industrialization of the West. Uh, but tomorrow's climate change will be depending on how the industrialization of the emerging economies is going to go. And that brings us on the entire discussion about what is left for those new countries, you know, joining the club of heavy emitters. And the brutal reality is that if we come down from the well below two degrees centi uh, centigrade limit, that two thirds, according to some even three fourths of the margin has been consumed already, uh, which brings the urgency for these commitments in the light of COP26 uh, with more prominence forward. Now, Europe's climate vision is strongly endorsing a multilateral approach. That's why Europe has been a very strong defender of the Paris Agreement, because it includes policy action by all countries, which was not the case under the Kyoto Protocol. So also emerging economies are asked to join the club of emissions that are required from them. And it intensifies, you know, the Europeans intensify bilateral action in particular towards the emerging economies, call them the G20 uh, group of countries. Now, Europe uh, is uh, putting itself forward as a first mover because it has a heavy climate responsibility, but it also sees economic opportunity. And I think that is an element that is new and that is where the Green Deal has been announced. And we could even say that Europe is now the laboratory, the laboratory for low carbon technologies and low carbon policies. Now on the next slide, you know, let's uh, zoom in on the Green Deal. I think it's fair to say that the Green Deal is an economic strategy and it encompasses climate and sustainability concerns for all economic sectors. Of course, energy is the most heavily you know, involved because fossil fuels are being consumed in masses in the energy sector, but also transport, industry, construction, agriculture, and forestry. You know, all these sectors are asked to move in with their emissions reductions. Now, a very important element of Europe's action is of course also on innovation, research and development, but perhaps even more so the deployment and the scaling up of investments in low carbon equipment and expenditure. And that is what I would like to zoom in for a moment later on. But what is so important on the European Green Deal, and that makes me happy as an economist, that is that we are moving the political attention 
away from targets. We have set our targets, that's now a done deal, but that we move our policy attention into policies. What are we going to do to bring the emissions down? And the regulations are key. And the, uh, the frustrating part, and I was myself involved in developing lots of regulations, is that the rollout of these regulations and policies is gradual, and it takes time. In fact, time that we do no longer have when we look at the figures put forward by the IPCC. Now, on the next uh, um, slide, you know, and from the impact assessment that the Commission has been making, I think this slide summarizes it very well where we are going with the Green Deal. That means that the GDP, our levels of income and wealth, should continue increasing, but our emissions should go down to zero or almost zero by 2050. And that is what is colored here and sketched out in the slide. By 2030, we see that the blue zone area, which is power generation, is going to have gone out almost entirely out of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, while the other two zones, the red zone and the green zone, respectively transport and industry, are going to see the bulk of their emission reductions after 2030, shortly after 2030. So now it's the moment to prepare for those uh, important emission reductions after 2030, but the biggest source of emission reductions before 2030 is going to be in the power sector. And the secret about the decoupling of economic growth from emissions is technology. And that is why we have to put in a lot of effort to bring forward low carbon technologies. On the next slide, um, I summarized a little bit what was uh, put on the table by the commission just before the summer holiday, a dozen of uh, policy proposals, which could be classified in three sorts of, uh, of policies, the market-based ones, uh, the ones relying on mandatory standards and benchmarks, and the ones uh, looking towards the governance in particular uh, by member states. I will uh, concentrate in my talk more on the market-based ones, the carbon market, the ETS, but also the disclosure of climate and sustainable information by private companies that is becoming mandatory. Um, I will leave aside um, the mandatory standards and benchmarks. They are important, you know, on car emissions. Uh, we see a phase out of the internal combustion engine by 2035. Um, we see that the technology is almost mature with the electric vehicle in particular. On the renewables, we have a quite ambitious target. Uh, but if we believe the market, we are going to beat even the 40% that is mandatory there for 2030. There are biofuel blending obligations for aviation. There are standards for fluorinated gases that are present in heat pumps. So there is a lot of mandatory standards and benchmarks that are being uh, developed as part of that policy package. And the governance tools is in particular the national energy and climate plans, because uh, somewhat half of the emissions are coming from transport buildings and agriculture, and uh, these are managed by the member states. And so having a proactive planning by the member states um, is very important. Let's move on the next slide to the Green Deal. And the point I want to make is that seen as an, um, as an economist, uh, the Green Deal is a tremendous investment challenge. According to the impact assessment, we talk about an annual additional investment of 350 billion euros between 2021 and 2030. So this is quite a, a daunting figure. It's almost 2% of GDP additional investment, almost a doubling of the investment that is currently happening in the economy. And it is going to be in the private sector, but also a lot by the public sector, because there is also infrastructure that needs to be updated. And energy is, of course, the most important sector. The rollout of investments in solar and wind and in the renewable sector is now really taking shape. But also the grid needs an upgrade. 
the digital developments that we are going to see are making a cluster of investments in the energy sector that are really you know, um, big and, and the scale becomes even bigger by the day. On transport, the electrification of the car fleet is, is something many member states still have to uh, move, move towards a, another level of, of activity. But that is, of course, depending also on the investments in the energy sector. Construction, um, the commission was talking about the renovation wave to improve radically energy efficiency, but also to have other ways of heating homes, in particular heat pumps, and the electrification of construction and buildings and transport is a very important trend. So which puts, again, the emphasis on a lot of investments in the field of energy. In the field of industry, um, I think between now and 2030, we are going to see more innovation type of activity, bringing forward the innovations for which the rollout massively may be expected more after 2030. We are talking about hydrogen, carbon capture and storage, and the carbon capture and usage and storage, the biochemicals drive. So on industry, we see currently in the steel, in cement, in chemicals, we see massive technological changing changes uh, that are going to uh, bring down the uh, emissions of greenhouse gases. So the Green Deal is a tremendous investment challenge. And the question is, where are all these sources of finance going to come from? And so on the next slide, um, I'm, I'm developing uh, some uh, examples uh, of sources of sustainable finance. I think Laura was already indicating where um, on the bonds and the green bonds, etc. Let me highlight three elements. The first is the EU funds, uh, the EU budget, and the, um, the post-pandemic pandemic resilience funds called Next Generation EU. Uh, you know, the 750 billion, that is uh, the new you know, type of uh, financing the EU that is being experimented with, which brings us forward with a daunting amount of 1850 billion euros that are going to be subject to a strong green dimension. 30% of these funds of the EU budget and 37% of the next generation EU budget is mandatorily to be spent in direct relation to the green agenda, to the Green Deal agenda. While at the same time, there is a no harm principle being used. That is that we would not, you know, would do damage and other fronts by the green investments that we are going to see. There are still plenty of multiple challenges. Uh, we just had a debate on the common agricultural policy that is uh, not yet bringing us entirely in line with the Green Deal uh, objectives, but that is going to be one of the key examples where we are going to see lots of um, more uh, discussions um, in the future. On the next slide, um, I wanted to make um, the carbon markets um, as an issue for also sustainable finance, because when we look at the EU ETS, uh, Europe's carbon market, we have been looking primarily at the price impact to reduce emissions. And as you can see, the prices have gone up spectacularly over the last couple of years. Uh, the price is today hovering around 60 euros per ton of carbon. So I should have updated my slide for you know, what we have been seeing over the last couple of weeks. But it is unlikely that prices are going to go below you know, the, the 50 euros of um, um, of uh, uh, the 50 euros uh, per ton of carbon dioxide that we have been uh, seeing over the last couple of weeks. Now, on the next slide, you know, um, the price impact is so important. We know that economists, Bill Nordhaus got the Nobel Prize winning uh, win for that theory that he has been doing on this issue. But the revenues, have been a little bit snowed under in the attention that we had 
for carbon markets. And uh, you know, just the back of the envelope estimate is indicating that the revenues from auctioning have easily, or are according to today's prices, are easily reaching the staggering amount of 50 billion euros. And these 50 billion euros go to the member states. And it is quite timely that um, member states now that these carbon prices are so high in combination with the high gas prices, that the social impact is being addressed because energy and electricity prices are you know, quite high, historically very high in most uh, parts of Europe and using part of the revenues from auctioning to dampen the social impact is, I think, uh, particularly important. And, and the Commission is going to come forward this week, it seems, with a communication on the issue. But what has been clear is that this social impact use uh, or this use of revenues for, the, for addressing the social impact should be used in a targeted manner and not in a eternal manner, but in a temporary uh, manner. Um, so the revenues from uh, the carbon market uh, are really an important element of the political debate. And um, innovation and modernization um, is, is clearly an issue that should continue going on. Now, dwelling a moment on the EU ETS, and I think that Laura was indicating that, we go for a larger scope uh, to include road uh, transport and heating fuels in an adjacent ETS system. And this separate system would converge over time with the main ETS system. Um, the main ETS system is being extended also to the maritime sector. But a very important new element is that uh, for the first time, the EU is proposing a correction at the border, a carbon border adjustment mechanism that should also raise revenue that could be used for the elements that I just was indicating, either social or innovation or internationally for support worldwide for those uh, going under uh, quite um, dramatic changes, for example, in the trade they are making with the EU. I wanted to make on the next slide a question mark on the voluntary carbon markets, uh, because since uh, Mark Carney has been chairing his task force on scaling up voluntary carbon markets, the question is there to what extent this voluntary carbon markets will be able to drive finance to low carbon, to encourage low carbon investments. And this voluntary carbon markets come from the demand for offsets, in particular to the multiple net zero announcements we are currently having from companies, local authorities, foundations, um, you know, a lot of demand coming from this net zero uh, announcements, because first companies should reduce their emissions as much as possible, but the remaining part is going to be subject of a demand for offsets. And then comes the question, where is the supply of these offsets going to come from? And that is where the private sector is very active, so it seems, but it is active without any public regulation. And so the question that is still hovering around is, will the voluntary carbon market be able to scale up itself through the creation of trust and confidence that this voluntary carbon market is requiring uh, because if that creation of trust and confidence would not happen, then it's difficult to see how important funds will be um, channeled through the voluntary carbon markets. Finally, third, uh, the next slide, um, I would like to put some attention on the greening of the private finance. Um, and there, a number of new initiatives have been taken by the Commission, the taxonomy regulation for sustainable activities is intended to put some light on what is green. I'm going to come into that in a minute. Uh, but once the definition of what is green is made, then this definition is going to be used in two important vehicles 
the corporate social reporting directive that would be applicable to all major companies, industrial companies, in with the mandatory obligation to create reliable and comparable sustainability information towards investors, but also other stakeholders. And that is part of a proposal by the commission. It's being negotiated in council and parliament, but it is hoping to put a fresh, um, um, a fresh um, approach to the ESG reporting, the environment, social and governance reporting that is today being implemented, but in a little bit of a creative manner, let's put it that way. And the third element that is already mandatory is the sustainable finance disclosure regulation that is applicable for all financial companies. So let's zoom in on the next slide on the taxonomy. The taxonomy is covering six environmental objectives, climate mitigation, climate change adaptation, uh, sustainable use and protection of water and marine resources, the transition to a circular economy, pollution prevention and control, and biodiversity. And the goal is on these six environmental objectives to increase sustainable investment in those six areas, but to limit as much as possible the greenwashing that we are currently seeing. Lots of activities currently are called green, but are they really green? And that is what the taxonomy wants to do. It is not creating a mandatory obligation for companies to go into green activities, but it creates an obligation when companies are uh, saying that they are going to go green, that they have to follow the classification that is developed under the taxonomy. And the European Commission is developing, you know, uh, implementing legislation as we go forward. Um, and the heat is in the debate in particular on whether natural gas and nuclear power generation is subject to um, uh, the taxonomy. Is nuclear and natural gas use a green activity? Yes or no? You may have followed the press. There are heated debates on this. So the taxonomy is there. It covers six environmental objectives and the implementation is being rolled out step by step. But so far, gas and nuclear is not yet covered by the EU taxonomy and the jury is out whether that is going to be the case. On the next slide, I zoom in on the sustainable finance disclosure regulation which is a very important one. And it is also the Irish commissioner, by the way, uh, Mrs. McGuinness, who is responsible for uh, the implementation of this sustainable finance disclosure regulation that is already applicable. And the goal is to create much more transparency on the ESG, you know, in particular, and the sustainable finance disclosure is applicable for financial companies and um, investors, uh, banks, and it is to, um, uh, to have much more information about the adverse impacts on sustainability that their actions may have. So it is improving transparency. And um, all financial market participants um, are covered uh, for the products they develop on the EU market. So also foreign financial market participants who are active on the EU market are subject to this sustainable finance disclosure regulation. And as of next year, there is going to be a list of indicators that are applicable to indicate the principal adverse impact of the activities that are being undertaken. So um, this SRF, SFDR is a very new kit on the block. And I was wondering whether my comments that I just make on the voluntary carbon market, whether the voluntary carbon market also uh, should not be uh, brought under the SFDR, uh, because after all the um, voluntary carbon market uh, 
uh, can be seen as um, trading financial uh, products and uh, the players there can be uh, interpreted as being financial market uh, participants. So a whole new um, machinery and in particular the indicators, the PAI, the Principal Adverse Impact Indicators are going to play an important role. So let me underline that this is already applicable, this legislation. Um, of course, we are not yet very far on the uh, disclosure in an orderly manner. Uh, for 2021, the first statements and project disclosures are, um, are falling already under the uh, legislation, but much more um, you know, streamlined um, indicators are still being uh, developed. So a very important uh, regulation to green the um, financial activities of financial market uh, participants in the EU. And I think through this, the potential of having and creating another Brussels effect in which uh, the EU is uh, putting up an implicit, an implicit standard on what is happening uh, possibly also elsewhere in the world. Um, also in the United States, for example, the financial regulator is very uh, interested in these uh, activities that are being rolled out in the EU. And I hope that a helpful debate is going to uh, develop in the immediate future. On the next slide, let me put up some conclusions. Um, the Green Deal is a comprehensive economic strategy but it requires a huge investment effort. And I would hope that a lot of economists looking at public policy uh, are going to include uh, the Green Deal dimension much more proactively in the policies they are coming to come forward with. Market-based instruments remain uh, central in the policy approach on climate change by the EU. But they are combined with a lot of other regulatory measures. And it is that combination that makes, I think, the EU um, very, um, uh, very um, successful in bringing forward emission reductions. There is an economic dimension and there is uh, a mandatory uh, regulatory dimension for one or the other specific area that needs to be uh, that or that is difficult to catch through the development of market-based instruments. And the greening of private finance, I hope is key and is being dealt with through new uh, legislation and the sustainable finance disclosure regulation, I think is a real, um, a real new instrument uh, that has not yet been discussed widely enough in my view, uh, apart from those who are immediately involved in the in the consultancy and the, in the private uh, finance world. So thank you very much for uh, your attention. Um, I produced a little book with my colleague Peter Viss um, that is um, freely downloadable through open access for all those who are interested. Um, it copes with the current legislation that we are having in place. But as I was indicating through the Green Deal, a lot of this legislation is now being reviewed and is part of a negotiation process in the institutions of the European Union. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Professor Delbecke. Um, I find the, the scale of the numbers that you're talking about um, just uh, eye-watering. I mean, nearly, nearly 2 trillion uh, euro over the, the period that we currently foresee and over a third of that uh, in relation to, to uh, uh, the the green the greening of our, of our uh, budgets, um, uh, you refer to um, uh, Commissioner McGuinness. Uh, Marine McGuinness was was writing at the weekend, uh, talking about uh, setting EU standards for green investment. And clearly, I mean it's it's perhaps a, it's a detailed point, but it's a potentially very damaging one. They hold greenwashing. Um, uh, do you see a significant role for uh, EU green bond standards in climate finance measures, 
And I think you, re you, you referred to the possibility of this being exported, becoming uh, international standards. Uh, would you say something on that? Uh, I know yeah. relatively detailed, but, but a rather crucial issue, please. Right, right. Well, um, the orientation that is being taken is either to develop specific products, such as green bonds, um, and they are uh, quite important. The European Investment Bank, I think Laura was indicating that at the beginning, um, is going into that uh, quite extensively, um, but and has been an innovator on, on this uh, in this area. But where I think the most powerful in, impact is going to come from this transparency, this regulation, the sustainable finance disclosure regulation, because it is addressing the whole bulk of private finance. Because let's face it, how staggering the numbers are on the public finance, private finance is the big player uh, those days. And fighting the greenwashing, I think uh, most of us will agree that when we look into the, the, the annual reports by companies, that there is a lot of green, you know, subjects being raised, but you'd never know exactly what is being covered. And this green washing, I will not say by all of them, but uh, increasingly, you know, people are looking into that. And at least half of what we see in the reporting by private companies is subject to green washing. Uh, others would say it's even up to 80%. I, I, I saw a recent report by uh, some green NGOs. I wouldn't be that dark. I think that many players in the sector are very honest and, and want to do a good job. But for that, you need a good regulatory context. And that is what the Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation is offering. And that is where I think Mrs. Uh, McGuinness is really sitting on an extremely important chair for uh, greening the economy in, in Europe and setting implicitly a world standard because a lot of other financial players from global players are also very active in the European Union and they will discover their standards as they have to implement them for all their activities inside the European Union. Thank you. Um, um, His, His Excellency um, Adrian Palm, the ambassador of the Netherlands to Ireland, raises a point which is of a certain sensitivity here in Ireland. Um, he thanks you for a very interesting presentation um, and, and says that uh, many, for many sectors, the way ahead on reducing carbon emissions is more or less clear, uh, like in uh, the power sector, as you highlighted. But for agriculture, uh, responsible for one third of greenhouse gas emissions in Ireland, this is still unclear. Um, he asks, what steps do you regard as essential for the agricultural sector to contribute substantially to our EU climate action goals and what financial instruments would be necessary? Well, I think it is obvious that the common agricultural policy uh, should be the vehicle uh, to drive the greening of agriculture, even uh, to put it a little bit uh, ironically, because agriculture is a green activity. Um, but the common agriculture policy makes important steps, but um, more in, you know, not in the core of the way subsidies are being managed, but rather ancillary. You know, in the margin, there are a lot of activities, sustainable activities are being financed, uh, but they are not in the core of the pricing of ag agricultural products like it should be. And that has been a heated debate in the, in the institutions. The European Parliament, as you know, you know had the very lively discussions on, on the issue. And there are two elements to be addressed. First is how to reduce the direct emissions from agriculture. It's you know, a lot of emissions uh, come from, from the uh, activities there. But even more important is the potential in agriculture to absorb carbon from the atmosphere. So the way uh, agricultural practices are going, um, you know, could and should be reviewed to improve the absorption of carbon and to store it in the ground instead of traditional activities where a lot of emissions are being, you know, through the way plowing is being done, are coming into, uh, into the air. Of course, animals 
um, are very important in this. And uh, the way cattle is being fed, uh, there are you know, new studies now coming forward where you can uh, come forward with uh, better feed for this um, for these animals and this feed can control the methane emissions that they are uh, emitting it's hard work i think that is still in front of agriculture because it is not as i don't dare to use the word simple as the power sector where you can switch from coal to gas from gas to renewables that is where and how we are reducing the emissions um, in the in the power sector, but on agriculture, we are at the beginning of a long process. Uh, production, emissions, carbon absorption, but also the way and the habits that people feed, uh, take food to themselves. Um, you know, there is a lot of uh, criticism on red meat that is possibly very bad for uh, for the climate in comparison to white meat that uh, chickens and, and, and things like that um, and, and pigs are much less damaging compared to red meat. So a lot of new developments, lots of structural changes ahead. I'm myself not particularly a specialist of the agricultural sector, um, but addressing emissions, absorbing um, through uh, the, the, the feeding of animals and, and things like that, other food patterns that uh, the society may adopt and the absorption of carbon in, 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 the, in the underground or in the ground, I think are very important elements to look at. Thank you, Joss. Um, the, I, I have a question from a, a journalist, uh, Porik Hoare with the Irish Examiner, and he asks, um, the sheer scale of the challenge uh, ahead is so daunting, not only because of the cost, but also the urgency of what must be done. But naysayers also said the same about post-war reconstruction from 1945 to 1953, that it couldn't be done. That period was a triumph of European cooperation. Is the current climate crisis analogous to 1945 to 53? Um, yes, but I would say if we um, do it in a clever manner, and that is where I think I would have to say the European Commission with the economic analysis they made in preparing for the Green Deal is using a lot of possibilities to keep the costs down as much as possible. Because if you make the wrong regulatory decisions, then the costs are going to be very high and cost effectiveness, you know, the hobby horse of the economist is very important because potentially you could drive up costs without improving much the overall result. And so um, uh, going in first where the low hanging fruit is, and that is exactly what the carbon market is doing. Uh, the carbon market is giving to many uh, people and companies the option either to reduce emissions themselves or ask someone else to reduce them and through that um, uh, cost effectively reducing emissions. Where I think we should be very much on our guard is to avoid stranded assets. And stranded assets is um, making the wrong investments now, you know, in the light of where we have to go. And I think that that is perhaps the most powerful element of the Green Deal and the carbon neutrality by 2050. Everybody knows the direction of travel. And if you go in and you um, have a disregard for that direction of travel, your chances of investing in the wrong issue is going to uh, become much more likely. So um, my reply would be that we are perhaps better equipped to where we were in 45. Of course, it was brutal in 45 with the destruction that the continent uh, was going through. So let's not go for such a radical destruction, but let's move in, let's phase in, in a cost-effective manner, um, uh, the, um, the uh, reduction of emissions. And above all, let's avoid stranded assets because that's very expensive. And I think that this uh, stranded asset um, uh, this avoidance of stranded assets is going to be improved a lot 
through the transparency that the sustainable finance disclosure regulation is going to offer us. Uh, so in that sense, I'm more hopeful that we have not to go through such a disastrous, you know, new reality as we saw in 45. Thank you. Uh, Mary Burke has a, a question uh, in relation to that regulation. She asks, would you comment further on the public sector infrastructure that would be necessary around the sustainable finance uh, disclosure regulation? Um, she uh, refers in particular to uh, uh, water scarcity measurement, testing, verification and sampling of air and water. Um, but um, the public sector uh, infrastructure is, is her query. Um, I think indeed that the demand for data is going to be staggering. And we are not yet fully equipped, neither in the public nor in the private sector, to um, already deliver all these data overnight. So that's why I think uh, the Commission made the right decision to make the sustainable finance disclosure regulation mandatory, but to be uh, to phase in gradually the data need uh, uh, over time. Um, and not too much time, but still allowing that still a lot needs to be done because uh, not all data uh, related to economic activities are in, um, in great detail yet available. Um, I think that the work that the European Environmental Agency is doing and new elements and new technologies like uh, uh, monitoring from space, uh, offering lots of uh, new data are going to be ways to, de 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 to develop much more proactively compared to what we did in the past. Um, and I, I see that these developments become available uh, in particular um, as regards space uh, or monitoring from space through satellites and things like that where in when it comes to forestry to agriculture you know these are very very important thank you um uh, there's a question on uh, changing the topic uh, 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 changing the area a little from a an economics researcher at the institute uh, doral walwer um uh, his question is, do you believe that the world needs a multilaterally negotiated global carbon price to be able to effectively ensure global emissions are reduced? Um, yes, I, I would be strongly in favor of a world carbon price or, you know, tax or market or whatever uh, we do it. Uh, but there is a but. Uh, and that is why it is probably the reason that it is not included in the Paris Agreement, that is that the authority uh, by parties to the Paris Agreement to go for a carbon tax slash carbon market uh, is their own internal responsibility. What Paris has been doing, the Paris Agreement, is setting objectives, targets, obligations, but not in the detail that is required to create such a carbon tax worldwide. That's why I would hope that the border adjustment, the carbon border adjustment, that um, mechanism that has been proposed by the Commission is going to lead to a fresh international debate because those exporting to the EU are not going to be very enthusiastic. That's what we heard from China, India, you know, Saudi Arabia, Russia, you know, they, they, they are very uh, they use very strong words uh, against this uh, border uh, tax. And I hope that in the context of either the G7, the G20, the WTO, we may go into a debate or the OECD where we have a little bit of uh, the emergence of comparing policies, um, having some more pressure to come forward with carbon pricing policies, we already see that happening. We even see in Russia, you know, where people are looking into the possibility of a carbon price because they see it as a rent that may be taken off by the EU to the disadvantage of Russia in this uh, context. And so out of this debate, I would not exclude that the debate of a carbon club is going to be dusted off. And a carbon club is a club of countries 
where you would agree that amongst the club members, there would not be trade restriction because their policies are comparable. But for all those who have not comparable policies, they would be a tax at the border. Um, so the tax at the border would be a kind of a de facto sanction for not having or not implementing a carbon price. And I think um, that that may be a very interesting route uh, for, um, uh, for, for discussions to go. And I would hope that economists could contribute into that. Uh, we know the Chinese go for a carbon market that is very similar to the European carbon market. They are going to roll it out, not only for power, but also for aviation, for steel, for cement, etc. So the Chinese are really working on that. What is my worry uh, and my deep regret is that it is not on the table in the United States. The idea of a carbon tax or carbon pricing came from the United States. Uh, they were trying to put it in the Kyoto Protocol. Um, we did it in Europe. The Chinese are doing it. But oh, irony, the United States is not taking any steps to do that. It's so controversial in the United States. And um, so reflecting further on the carbon club idea, I would welcome very much a carbon club. I would welcome very much a multilateral approach to a carbon price or a carbon tax. But what are we going to do if the United States does not play ball on this issue? And that yeah. is a, a bit of a headache. We all would have hoped with the arrival of Biden that they would have been more proactive on this issue, but it is not in the major act that Biden is currently negotiating on the Hill. Um, there are here and there some hoops, but they are being weakened as the process uh, continues. Yeah. So yes, there is scope, it's hard work, and I hope that the Europeans are going to use their carbon border adjustment mechanism proposal to make a next step in that direction. A, a related question, should businesses in developing countries be exempt from the uh, adjustment mechanism, given that these, well, the, the countries have the, uh, historically uh, not responsible for the climate crisis? I would uh, personally be in favor of that um, because they were not, as you are indicating, at the source of the problem, but it goes against some of the basic principles of the World Trade Organization, uh, that you cannot have any form of discrimination uh, between the trading partners according to the countries they are coming from. So I would hope, and we need a debate um, in the WTO, uh, so as possibly to allow such an exemption um, uh, for the carbon border adjustment mechanism that the Europeans uh, are having put on the table for more discussion. Uh, so um, we need a discussion not only on climate, but also on trade policy. And that's a very hard nut to crack, as we all know in the WTO, uh, but it's unavoidable. We will have to raise uh, that debate and we will have to put it on the table. Well, um, I, we're, we're coming close to the end and there are quite a few questions so I have to be uh, selective and I'll take, um, if you're talking about tough, tough nuts to, to crack, there are two questions, one from Osir Kudyaba and another from Jean Boucher, um, which are about the, the degrowth strategy, about that, uh, uh, you know, consumption sufficiency, one even going so far as to suggest that the Green Deal could be construed as a kind of greenwashing if given its continued focus on GDP and growth and so on, um, do we need to focus on a degrowth strategy, uh, please? Um, I would be hesitant to go into that uh, line because what we have been observing in the past is that economic growth facilitates change. Um, and if you have no economic growth, uh, you camp on old assets. And what we are clearly in need for is new assets that are low in carbon, low in carbon emissions. And so without economic growth, we will not be able to do that. Now, having said that, I'm not pleading for growth figures like we have seen in China or 10% per year, et cetera. That is clearly doing harm to, to the planet. 
but we need a little bit of economic growth uh, to facilitate the transition we are going through. So um, I, my argument would be in between, you know, uh, the two, not very high economic growth, not zero economic growth, but a little bit to facilitate the change we are going through. Otherwise, the, uh, the Green Deal uh, objectives, the emission reductions, 55% by 2030 is very important, is drastic. Uh, you will not uh, achieve that through degrowth. You will achieve that through the use of, uh, of new capital, new equipment, new tools, uh, insulated uh, houses. Um, and for that, you need a bit of economic growth to facilitate that. Um, Professor Joss Dilbeke, on behalf of the EPA and the IIEA, I want to thank you sincerely for uh, giving us the benefit of the enormous uh, uh, experience of this whole area that um, uh, you speak to us today on, on, that, on that platform. And um, this isn't uh, by any means the end of the topic. It's one, of course, we will have to return to time and time again. But thank you very much for your insights today. We are very grateful to you. You're Good. very much welcome. It was my pleasure.